Hi, Todd Freeman, pastor of College Hill Presbyterian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, sitting out on my backyard here on Christmas Day 2021. I think I'm always going to remember this year as the COVID that stole Christmas Eve. Again, apologies without knowing I had COVID a week ago and led worship last Sunday, led to our protocol policy that we rightly followed by canceling in-person worship on Christmas Eve and the Sunday after. So I'm recording this as an introduction to the Sunday after service from the video, virtual video that we recorded last year. Uh, I, I hope you were able to enjoy Christmas Eve and Christmas. A big thank you to Bill Knoll for leading a brief parking lot service last night. Uh, God is with us. This is Emmanuel. And the promise and the mystery of the incarnation is that God and creation cannot be separated. That God is with us and within us. And may you experience the peace and the hope and the joy and the love of this season now and throughout the entire new year. Blessings to you all. Amen. Hello and welcome to virtual worship for this December 27th, 2020, here at College Hill Presbyterian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Just a few announcements. Uh, our liturgist today will be Todd Freeman, because I wanted to uh, make sure that I didn't have to call anyone in on this Saturday, the day after Christmas when we are videoing to not be where they need to be on this day. And uh, especially want to give uh, a good break and a humongous thank you to Bill Knoll, who has been here almost every week for the last nine and a half months, helping to video, helping to edit, and uh, as together we collaborate and try new and creative things here during worship. So Bill, I hope you're getting some good rest and thank you for everything. With those announcements, oh, one more, a very special one. I'm taking the week off now. So after this Sunday, uh, I will be resting myself for a week. Have a very safe and happy new year. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds to worship God as we listen to this morning's prelude. And just to mention, all of our music this day was also previously videoed, so people would not have to be here today. Blessings. Today's prelude is a gospel hymn, and the name of it is Jesus, Oh, What a Wonderful Child. And there's some uncertainty as to who actually composed it, but most credit is given to Margaret Wells Allison, a black lady who moved from South Carolina up north at the age of four, and she became the leader of music at the Little Temple Pentecostal Church, and she's the one, and her choral group was known as the Angelic Gospel Singers. They were the first ones to record this. I hope you enjoy it. Jesus, so lovely, meek, and wild. My 
Oh, what a wonderful child. Please join with me in our call to worship. During this season of Christmas, we celebrate the birth of Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us. God's love surrounds us wherever we are. The Spirit of God dwells within us. Our eyes have been opened to see the light. Let us rejoice in the gift of new life. Let us break forth into singing. Please join with me in the prayer of confession. Let us pray. God of all creation, we thank you for the love that surrounds us and for your spirit that dwells within us. As we continue to celebrate the birth that offers us rebirth, unite our hearts and minds in a spirit of peace and unity. Help us to overcome attitudes and actions that can cause harm to ourselves and others. Open us to a fuller vision of life's possibilities. As we seek to understand and experience your grace and forgiveness, hear our silent prayers of reflection and confession. God's forgiving presence is among us to bring healing and wholeness. May the God of mercy who forgives our sins strengthen us in all goodness. Amen. Peace before us, peace behind us, peace under our feet. Peace within us, peace over us, let all around us be peace. The peace of Christ be with you.
the assigned lectionary gospel passage for this first Sunday of Christmas, and to remind everyone that Christmas is itself a 12-day season. This is the first Sunday, and then there will be a second Sunday of Christmas before we enter the season of Epiphany. Today's gospel reading comes from Luke 2, starting at verse 21. The previous story, Luke tells about the birth of Jesus and the angel coming to the shepherds and the shepherds visiting the manger. And we continue immediately with these words. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child, and he was called Jesus the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the time came for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of Moses, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace, according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age, having lived with her husband for seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there and fasted and prayed, prayed night and day. And at that moment she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom and the favor of God was upon him. May God bless the reading and the hearing of this word. Amen. Well, welcome to the final service of this year of our Lord 2020. Can I get an amen? What a year it has been in the life and ministry of this congregation, and most certainly within our own lives, and my goodness, the life of the world. And after a physically distanced Christmas Eve service in our church parking lot just a few days ago, we, like the biblical gospel writer Luke, move ahead to what lies beyond the celebration of the birth of Jesus. We also move ahead 
in a few more days into a new year. And in so many respects, we thankfully leave this year behind us. There will be much more to share about that in the weeks ahead. Like, how can we enter the year with the expectation of finding the holy in unexpected people and places, in family and friends and strangers? So for Mary, Joseph, and baby Jesus, life goes on from that moment that we celebrated on Christmas Day. And the gospel story moves forward from the manger in Bethlehem to the temple in Jerusalem a week later. And we are actually indebted to the gospel writer for a text that speaks to us after the shepherds, the angels, and the heavenly hosts are gone. Mary and Joseph now have a son to raise, religious obligations to keep, and an arduous trip back to Nazareth. And each one of us now will also move ahead in our own lives into a new year, as we will also do so as a community of faith. And the good news of the story of Christmas, the story of Emmanuel, is that God is with us as we journey forward. And before we move ahead too quickly, however, I want to spend a bit of time sharing what we can learn from this story from Luke 2. We learn, for instance, that Joseph and Mary are poor because they offer a sacrifice of two turtle doves or two pigeons at the temple. Now, this was the exception to the law when the poor could not afford the customary sacrifice of a lamb. Luke wants us to be aware right from the very start that Jesus begins his life in solidarity with the poor, whose causes he will champion throughout his ministry. We also learn through the repeated phrase, in accordance with the law of Moses, that Joseph and Mary were dedicated to faithfully following their religious beliefs. By observing the Jewish law, the Torah, they model putting their faith into action. And Luke wants to tell us that the family from which Jesus came represents the best of true Israel. I always get a kick out of reminding folks that Jesus was not a Christian. Jesus was a Jew. Well, engaging in those religious and spiritual practices is reflected throughout the rest of chapter 2 when we are introduced to Simeon and Anna, also both true saints of Israel. They are prophets and rich sources of wisdom, and they are also elderly. Luke reflects the honoring of wise elderly people. And communities of faith like ours have wise and elderly, Simeons and Annas, whose faithfulness have helped us to recognize God's sacred presence in our midst and whose trust in God has shown us how to live expectantly. Who have been, and currently are, the Simeons and Annas in your life and in the life of this congregation? Well, I could name several. So Luke's story poses the question, do we value and listen to the stories of the elderly. Perhaps we need to focus more on what Richard Rohr encourages us as a strong spirituality of aging. Now, notice the focus of Simeon and Anna. Simeon was, quote, longing for the consolation of Israel. And Anna speaks to those, quote, who were awaiting the liberation of Israel. Luke's understanding of salvation 
includes Israel's liberation from oppression. And our understanding of liberation, rather, our understanding of salvation, includes liberation for all in the here and now. So may our own ministry and mission then continue to focus on this theme of liberation, a liberation which reaches from individual release to community justice and peace. But as Simeon prophesizes, this child is destined for the falling and rising of many in Israel. Jesus' ministry will cause division. Some people will receive him, some people will reject him. And we too must make a choice. Are we on the side of justice for the poor, for women, for people of color, for those who society consider less than? Are we on the side of demanding and working toward radical inclusion? I want to spend a bit more time now on a fairly obscure biblical character. I'm referring back to the prophetess Anna. Anna is mentioned only in the Gospel of Luke and only this one time. And all we have to go on are three short verses. We are introduced to Anna at the presentation of the baby Jesus in the temple in Jerusalem the week after his birth. And all Luke tells us about her is that she is a prophet. She is from the tribe of Asher, which is, from, which is in the old northern kingdom of Israel. And she is very old, and she has been a widow for most of her life. And we also learn that Anna is a devoutly spiritual woman who worships, fasts, and prays night and day. And upon seeing the infant Jesus, she gives thanks to God and is said to have continually spread the word about the child. Well, that's it. That's all we have to go on in trying to understand who this Anna is and why Luke considered her important enough to include in his gospel. Remarkably, however, there is a wealth of theological information packed into these three short verses. For when seen through the lens of a society and culture in which she lived in ancient Palestine, we know that Anna had a lot working against her. She was a woman, a widow, and elderly. The cultural values of her time basically associated men with honor and women with shame. In a like manner, old age was associated with weakness. And female widowhood was associated with being needy. And while men were easily recognized as spiritual leaders, women's spirituality was more often than not viewed as contingent upon and even secondary to that of men. As an historical character then, Anna would have been associated with shame, weakness, need, and being a second-class citizen. Luke's original readers would have been aware of all of these things much more so than we are today. The Reverend Glacia Vasconcelos Wilkie, a former staff, may, uh, staff member in the Presbyterian Church USA office in the national office in Louisville, Kentucky, and before that a seminary professor in Brazil and a missionary to Portuguese-speaking people in Canada, reflected on this passage from Luke in a sermon this way. The gospel story for this first Sunday after Christmas continues the surprising revelation of the fullness of God's grace manifested in Jesus' birth. 
In the birth of the Christ child, a new era has begun, and all creation is called to break forth in wonder. By Anna's actions, the old oppressive patterns of gender, age, and marital status begin to crumble. Anna has encountered the liberating God in Jesus. Anna foreshadows a phenomenon that decades later the Apostle Paul writes about when he describes the kingdom of God with the words, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. Anna and all other people to whom society throughout time pays little or no honor, children, women, the elderly, the differently abled, the enslaved, those of different heritage, all in Jesus Christ are equal before God. And that includes you and me. We learn in this passage that after witnessing the Christ child, Anna went out and spoke to, quote, all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. So perhaps most remarkably, in Luke's gospel, Anna becomes one of the very first evangelists, which is simply a person who shares with others the good news. And those others include those who were not present in the temple, others who were considered to be outsiders, others who were simply hoping for salvation. And that's the gospel, the good news for us on this first Sunday of Christmas. In Jesus Christ, no one is separated from God by distinctions or limitations of any kind. Rather, each one of us is equally a beloved child of God. And one more brief comment about Anna. Anna provides us a model for our own ministry. Like Anna, we too should be compelled to go out into the world and bear witness to the good news, the gospel of God's inclusive grace and love. And following the steps of the elderly, widowed woman named Anna, who out of oppression's grip was silent no longer, we too can become instruments of God's reconciliation and hope, peace, joy, and love. Or as brilliantly stated in a poem by the influential black author, theologian, educator, and civil rights leader, Howard Thurman. When the song of the angels is silent, when the star in the sky is gone, when the kings and princes are home, when the shepherds are again tending their sheep, when the manger is darkened and still, the work of Christmas begins to find the lost, to heal the broken, to feed the hungry, to rebuild the nations, to bring peace among people, to befriend the lonely, to release the prisoner, and to make music in the heart. That sounds like a great mission statement and motivation as we move forward in our own lives and the ministry efforts of ourselves as a community of faith into this new year. It is now time that we move ahead, taking with us that which is life-giving into this new year and leaving behind that which is not. For life does indeed go on. And like Anna, may we live in ways that keep us open and attentive to God's presence and work in and among us. Amen.
Please join with me in our affirmation of faith. God sent the promised deliverer to God's people. Jesus, the long-expected Savior, came into the world as a child, descended from David, born of Mary. Jesus announced to God's people the coming of God's kingdom of justice and peace. All things will be renewed in Christ. In Christ, God gave us a glimpse of the new creation that God has already begun and will surely finish. I'd like to share with you a very special prayer on this day. It was written by the Reverend Phil Campbell. Many in this congregation know Phil as the brother of our own Jim Campbell. Well, Phil is now retired, but he was invited to offer a prayer for Christmas Day from the church where he was formerly the pastor at Park Hill United Church of Christ in Denver. Let us pray. Emmanuel, God with us, again this year you come. No Herod is strong enough, no hurt deep enough, no disaster shattering enough to keep you from us. Our waiting is over. Attune our ears and sharpen our eyesight so that you do not miss your advent here this year. O oh, you who chose the quiet ways of still small voices and births of babes, rather than loud spectacles of earthquake, fire, marching legions and conquering hordes, heighten now our awareness of your loving presence all around us. You come into a world of holiday gatherings and hospital rooms, into a world of carefully wrapped presents and economic hardship, into a world of children laughing and COVID sufferers dying into a world of lasting friendships and those shattered by political upheaval, into a world of opulent excess and chronic hunger, into a world of many mansions and many more meager mangers. Emmanuel, God with us. Again this year, you come. And we are grateful our waiting is over. Or is it? It feels different this year, God, or maybe it is always this way. Even amid the celebration of Christmas morning, the pandemic rages. The loneliness of social distancing separates us. Partisan divisions beset us. And the world and so many who dwell herein are in peril. Pain and sorrow accompany our joy. We desperately want all to be well, but we know all is not well. So still we wait. We need you, Emmanuel, not to remain a baby as wondrous and joyous as your birth is. We need you to grow in wisdom and stature and favor with all people and all that is holy. We need you to preach good news to proclaim liberation and to guide us in the ways of justice and peace. How long, Holy One, will we have to wait? Emmanuel, God with us. Again this year you come. You come and join us in our waiting. You come and remind us to wait also means to serve. You come and comfort us amid the not yet of justice delayed, and compel us to action in the ongoing struggle for justice yet to come. You join us on the journey and reveal to us the grace notes waiting to be encountered along the way. You come and wait with us for a rebirth of wonder that will make all things new. Emmanuel, God with us. Again this year you have come and reclaimed this world as your dwelling place. You have come and you equip us to actively wait with purpose. You enlarge our capacities to live and move and be as your people. 
and you will make us anew in your image so that we can be demonstrators of love, makers of peace, and builders of habitations of justice and joy for all of creation. Emmanuel, God with us, come. And here now, as we pray together, our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Join with me now in our charge and benediction. Go forth to proclaim the message that God is with us. Reach out to those who may need to hear this message of hope. God grants us life in all of its fullness and calls us to be who we are created to be. We go forth refreshed, renewed, and empowered to serve God and others. So wherever you find yourself this day, this week, and into the new year, know that God goes before you to lead you in the way. If God goes behind you to encourage you, if God goes above you to bless you, if God goes beneath you to support you, if God goes beside you to befriend you, and God goes within you to empower you to live your life to the glory of God, our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>